Good morning. Um, great to see you all. Obviously, we have a few folks who, uh, for very, because of travel plans, aren't you know have been a big part of the last couple of days and aren't here. But we certainly have an incredible critical mass here this morning. Thanks for uh, being part of that and coming to this last session. Um, I think. Our hopes for this last session are really uh, embodied by the circle, a totally uh, open kind of conversation and taking stock of what's happened here, but I think especially kind of where we're going, what's needed, what thoughts are, and I think there's, diff you know, one we is certainly, you know, this group of people in Georgetown and the kind of constellation that's come together, but I think there's lots of we's that are in dialogue and discussion here, so and so. Uh, feel free to speak on behalf of, of different weeds, different groups. Um, there are just a couple of really prosaic kind of pragmatic things that I can name right away that are are happening to, um, in terms of uh, like the website. As a um, already, as I mentioned quickly yesterday, there's a space on that site that's a kind of resource page, and it's a, meant to be a, a, a growing page, but it's got links to basically all, you know, we think, I haven't actually comprehensively gone back over it, but the <coughs> idea was to create links to sort of all of the relevant organizations and projects that are kind of centrally represented here, and potentially to add others to those. And the hope is, even though many people are in touch with many people, that that's a, a space to to go to and, and, and use in that way. And then also will be, in terms of a lot of people have just been asking about contact with each other and, you know, so we'll, we'll have a really um, great uh, sort of email listserv, clear, transparent way that everybody can be in touch with everybody else without that being all about trying to find business cards that are <laughs> uh, buried somewhere. So those are, those are a couple of um, small things. But I know, uh, I think what we wanted to do, and Cynthia, um, feel free to uh, frame anything differently before we begin this process, but it was this question of what's needed. We began to excavate it some uh, at lunch yesterday in, uh, uh, at the four tables. And um, I think then a lot of things continued in the rest of the day yesterday to kind of surface in the room around what's needed and things got said very explicitly about what's needed so it may be that even since lunch those conversations are evolving but we thought we'd begin with those kind of four discussion leaders to sort of frame what got said there and their own thoughts and then kind of open that up. I think that my sense even from talking with those four is there are going to be some overlapping themes and thoughts and what will happen at those tables and then also some, some individual and specific ones. Um, so does that sound, does that sound, does anyone want to offer anything before we move into the, that kind of what is needed uh, sort of overview or distillation? Great. Does any one of those four people want to begin? Daniel, <laughs> why um, so, uh, first I just want to say there is a ride board out front now, out to the left of, as you go out this door, for people who want to share rides to the airport or the train station or, or anywhere else you might want to share a ride to. Um, so we can reduce our carbon footprint and, and save some money. So please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, I, I'd like to think of these reflections as an ode in four parts. Um, the first part is more questions. Um, since I, since on the panel the other day, I, I asked you all to ask questions. I have some questions, and I just want to start with Yaya's beautiful statement um, yesterday. It is important to work together to see me and to see you. So the, I heard a bunch of models being discussed, and um, and I'd like to ask people to fill in whatever I'm missing. Um, presenting international companies, producing translations of international plays applied arts, traveling abroad to work with local populations abroad, using applied arts locally, touring productions abroad, quote unquote cultural exchange, quote unquote cultural uh, diplomacy, underwriting supporting artists abroad coming here, um, I'm sorry, underwriting and supporting artists abroad from here, but underwriting and supporting them there, and then bringing artists and scholars to the US. So uh, under the umbrella of, of this weekend, that's a lot. Did I miss any other any mo any other models that jump out? 
I would add um, that there is the, the going there and the bringing here, but there's also the existing in where you are and in using the virtual space to have a real relationship and, and um, that's something that we're sort of exploring. But I think you Thank can you. stay where you yeah. are and still have a really rich exchange. Yeah, telemetry. Yeah. Telemetry is a very important part of that. Thank you. Yeah. Like the model of Sundance East Africa and other colleagues, um, exchanges that are designed to cultivate local capacity. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I think that, I don't know what telemetry is actually. So that's like video conferencing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's important. Using but using telematic. Yeah, that's, that's okay. the term that's being used. Um, now. Okay. I'm glad to catch up on that. <laughs> 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 um, I, that just raises another uh, point that the Nadia on my panel had wanted to say, and she had to leave just the amount of access online, and you guys were the only ones who really brought that up, but I think that is um, an important thing to emphasize, that it isn't all physically going and coming. And then just, and, and Danny, this just may not have been part of your conversation, but I I didn't hear, and, and um, perhaps I missed it, but something that we're trying to do here is actually bring about more of a connection between artists coming and going and, and looking and observing online and the political, social events in those places. Mm -hmm. So it is really, I mean, there are many wonderful conferences about cultural exchange and I'm all for it. I think it's great, but I, I, that isn't what I signed up for, increasing cultural exchange. So we're right. really going to try to figure out how mm -hmm. to leverage that cultural exchange in a way that it intersects with the um, what's going on with Okay, great. Great, thank you. Yeah, maybe I just didn't hear it, but the other part of what I missed, and I think it relates to this, is the notion of audiences and multiple audiences. Audiences here, audience there, audiences there for local capacity that's built, mm -hmm. but also audiences here and those kind of exchange that are mediated through the arts mm -hmm. that are about the audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. um. Uh, yeah, Jonathan and then Joseph and then. I thought it was important what was talked about um, communicating with the Foreign Service Institute and mm -hmm. training our diplomats to understand how they can use the resources that we all represent. Right. Um, but also what wasn't spoken about directly, but several people here are involved with the Fulbright program. And the Fulbright program represents a lot more money and resource than the direct cultural programming budget. And artists are invited to participate, Roberta can bear me up on this, that, that artists are invited to participate in the Fulbright program in a lot of very intensive ways that, that allow for, for the artist to create the vehicle and create the means and create the program. Mm -hmm. And that can be something that can be piggybacked mm -hmm. upon. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think that those, we, we need to understand more right. what, what is there. Right. This is great. I was actually um, really at the beginning just trying to frame the remarks by, um, by reflecting back the breadth of the types of things that we've attempted to grapple with. I mean, there, there are many, many, many more models, and, 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 and Joseph, and please speak. And, but I just, I wasn't, I haven't even gotten to our table discussion yet. I was just trying to frame it. I was just trying to fr just give, give, give a scan of how how much we're trying to talk about and how different, I mean, even just between the first two, um, producing uh, foreign companies and producing foreign work in translation locally are, are, are almost two entirely different conferences. So I was just trying to, uh, that's, that's what I was, was trying to show, was the, the, how big the elephant is that we're trying to, to wrestle. Um, well, I don't know if this is the right time. But, um, uh, we did, uh, in the process series, four new translations talked about translations mm -hmm. as an art form that needed process as well as you know new work in general mm -hmm. and that we need to sort of nurture that and so few theaters do it and so I propose that that conference uh, this translation conference that's connected to the series um, uh, a, a model like the National New Play Network mm -hmm. which encourages new work in in the states which you know as, as people know who work here it's really hard to get new plays off, and especially once there's a premiere, getting other theaters to pick mm -hmm. up new plays. And I was saying, well, and it's even harder in some sense to get new translations produced throughout the states. Mm -hmm. And so 
to, to develop a, a network of theaters mm -hmm. um, that are, are connected and institutions. The National New Play Network is just theaters, but I think academic institutions and other institutes that are focused on <coughs> translation, such as the Goethe, you know, the Japanese cultural system. And All Theater Without Borders actually has on our website a whole initiative that's been started by a couple of our members around that as well. So I think this is one of the things that was said at the table is that so many of us are doing so much overlapping work right. or intersecting work. How do we then mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, pool our resources and, and really um, so that your project and then Sarah Sunday, who's, you know, that, how do we get all of these people talking to each other so we're not duplicating each other's efforts? So that, I think, is one of the things that, um, I guess my, my, my four odes are going to happen out of order. Um, yeah, that, is one of, that is one thing that could really come out of here, is it's just very clear how, how many people are, right. are trying, to, um, trying to slice the same pie. So. Right. I'm going to stop using metaphors in a second. <laughs> I just, uh, Cynthia, I, I, I just um, didn't quite um, hear what you were saying. Were you saying that you, your interest is only as cultural exchange relates to foreign policy? Can you, can you? Oh, I'm saying, perhaps there's something wrong if I'm saying this and this is people now, but kind of idea behind this conference was to explore the intersection of cultural work in wherever it is taking place and uh, foreign policy, international relations, social change, peace building, anything going on in society and politics in that place. And that comes out of a recognition that in so many societies, the um, artists and cultural figures are real agents of social change, and that is not often recognized by the people in the political sphere. So, for example, in your case, it was. The embassy understood the political impact and societal impact of presenting a controversial play that raises issues that are very political in China. So in your case, it's a it's the best practice case where it worked. Um, there are many other cases where cultural figures, and unfortunately due to the budget, we couldn't have as many here as we would like, but Shahid Nadim is a great example. Haitham with his play about democracy is another example. Uh, where the artists are really the canaries in the coal mines, who are the ones out there exploring further, pressing, you know, pushing the envelope. And the work that they do, the local artists in the places, is very often not recognized, not absorbed, not integrated into um, policy by their own government and definitely not by ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there was a, uh, an event at Asia Society recently, and cultural figures were on the stage talking about their complications with getting the State Department and getting um, political people to hear them. And they were saying, well, we have these projects, and they're wonderful, but and, and we can talk to the cultural affairs people at embassies, but when it comes to the front office, mm -hmm. meaning the ambassador and the people who really say yes or no, um, it gets stopped because it doesn't meet mission goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is another, this, what, I, what I took from that is that the artists on stage and the arts institutions had not addressed their power and their voice in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't speaking, they weren't speaking to mm -hmm. that mission, which in this case um, is the next generation, Muslim communities, um, uh, disenfranchised communities. I mean, the kinds of communities that all of us are addressing. So it's a question of vocabulary and understanding how to how to make the case. Mm -hmm. You don't make the case that we have the best theater production or we have the best. I mean, everybody here understands this, but I'm not sure that everybody is actually utilizing the power of what they do to communicate with embassies. Mm -hmm. I want to so, make sure in the, in the time we have that the distillation work that our four have done gets out there too, because I think that that may 
help in a certain, it's just that we don't end up not getting to that. So let's right. No, I mean, these are all really important um, conversations and actually I think that this will help with this sort of these, these questions and thoughts that I have. So just in, in reflection um, quickly to the, 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 really the first two days, um, I kept hearing the term theater be used. So my questions are, what is, is the theater? Term? theater? Theater. So my question is, what is theater? And where is theater? I think that speakers were speaking from different perspectives of what theater is, where it is, who it's for. Um, and I think it's really important that to recognize that there were many different uses of that term uh, over the course of this weekend, and, and, and all valid uses. But, but I just wanted to note that, that people were often speaking from different uh, understandings of or, or had different perspectives on theater and also the conversation about aesthetics my question is whose aesthetics and um, from what cultural perspective aesthetics we also talked about the local and um, my question is which local I live in New Mexico and um, I think only one person in three days mentioned the indigenous population in the United States and so I just would like to bring that population into our understanding and reflection about the local. Um, can we think of diplomacy as multi-directional and not what can my country do for someone else or what can the presence of my government do in another country? So Derek and I were talking last night and, and maybe um, because this term cultural diplomacy, uh, there have been a lot of side conversations about how vexed a term it is and maybe we want to think about intercultural diplomacy. Um, that there's, a, that there's a back and forth. Uh, Layla said the other day, we distinguish between the American people and American foreign policy. And again, just teasing out these strands of, of, of people versus governments. And um, also how the, the global and the local are in dialogue and how they can um, create mutual understanding. There was this conversation about Baghdad um, and, and how it's bombed out a burned out city and that there are no movie theaters and the South Bronx in the 1970s out of which hip hop was born. I mean a much smaller population but there were no movie theaters. There was planned shrinkage. There was, um, I mean almost every other building was bombed out, burned out by um, uh, landlord fires and things. So just the way that these things can be in dialogue with each other oftentimes when I do a presentation on hip hop I show pictures of the South Bronx and I ask people where it is and the most common uh, place that people guess that it is is Baghdad. So um, it, it was interesting to hear the other <coughs> the other perspective. Uh, at at the table with me yesterday were Alicia Adams, Ping Chong, Sharon Memis, Margot Lee Sherman, Adrian Alice Hansel, Tracy Francis, John Vole, and Nick Hull. So I just want to um, bring them into the cipher into this conversation. The, these are their thoughts as well. The what do we need um, question. We were talking about sustainability. Uh, and I would ask, what does that mean exactly, and in what context? And um, I think we've started using that as a global word, but I'd like to apply some more pressure to it <laughs> to get more specific about it. Um, that we need a, that we need two-way processes uh, in thinking about all of these numerous models that that we laid out at the beginning here. Uh, symmetry and exchanges in in terms of power relationships, a process that encourages self-reflection and demanding of our leaders that they be self-reflective. Um, again, this is called from the table conversation at lunch yesterday. Structure for us, this us here in this room, to work more as a community. So what kind of structure would allow for that to happen? More informed media. Um, a separation of cultural diplomacy from government, as uh, um, the British Council model seems to, to be. And how do we get government to trust the artist? Um, and my sort of um, commentary on that is, does government in fact trust itself? Does, gov does government believe in or trust diplomacy as a model, the ability for humans to connect, change, affect each other, and leave ideology behind? Or is it kind of micromanaging? Is diplomacy, a, uh, ha has it become a kind of a way of micromanaging ideology and propaganda? Is this something that I'm, and then my larger question is, in, in terms of, asking a government to trust the artist is, is this something that a market economy can afford to do? Doesn't a market economy, to a certain extent, attempt to control thinking, attempt to control power relationships in order to perpetuate itself? Um, Layla said, in Iraq, we have no place to live life, so we bring life to the theater so we can be free. 
just want to keep bringing artist voices back into this conversation. And moving forward, I just want to briefly uh, let folks know about two very interesting conversations that have happened uh, in terms of future action that people might want to get on board with. I had a very interesting conversation with Peter Marks about really um, asking the press to take up the same charge that he was asking theaters to take up, and that all the things that he was asking theaters to do in terms of dialogue and education, that, the, that asking the press to really um, use world music as a model where uh, a single concert can be reviewed because it's part of criticism, not part of a review, and it's a criticism that, that has an overarching um, educational or conversational dialogue uh, with, with the readership so that, as uh, somebody said yesterday, yes, maybe they missed that concert from a group from Mali, but if they read a well-written piece of criticism, they might be interested to go to the next group from Mali that is in town, and that I think we can use that same model. And he was very excited by that, and just very excited to be in communication with artists. And so we're hoping that maybe using Georgetown, we can leverage some kind of dialogue there with, with the press. And then the second thing is that, um, Penny Ojeda, is Penny here? I think she's going to be here this morning. Um, she, she and I were talking yesterday about these training sessions that happen for diplomats and training or people going out into the field. And she was really explaining to me why those sessions have not been useful. Because basically in 45 minutes, someone's trying to cover all of the visual art, music, dance, and theater happening in the United States that they might want to program one day. I mean, that's what those training sessions look like. And so um, she was, ex she was I don't, I mean, I think there was some frustration about the way that this has been slotted into that training, but she did mention that an entirely different kind of training is being offered to them from a, a German source where they're using film and, and, and manuals that are downloaded and passed on to them about something else. And I said, well, why don't we create a 30 minute video with artists who do this kind of work around the world saying what we need to be, what, you know, what, is it, what does it take to come into your constituency, your, your embassy, and, and work and do this work. And she, her face lit up, and she just thought that would be, you know, great. So that's another project that I think, as a, as a cohort, we can begin to think about. Um, so finally, just to reflect. Can I just briefly come in? I think that, that is a fantastic idea, the 30 minute video. That, that, that's one little part of the training. They're, they're, they're in training for two weeks. Right. Uh, but, and she's talking about the specific training for the cultural attaches. Um, sadly, I, I, you know, I don't know what goes on in those two weeks. It's really hard to imagine because the times that I've spoken at them and, and spoken about, um, I recognize the problems with the term, but making culture a part of what you do in the country, using local artists, hosting artists, showing films, you're making it part of what you do as, you know, we're talking about a cultural attaché here, they always say this is the first time we've heard this. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what they do in those classes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, but the, you know, the, you know, the arts of the United States in 45 minutes is just one part. They're there for two weeks doing God knows Other what. things, right, but, yeah. But, but so the 30 minute, but I think the 30 minute video is a fantastic idea, and, and maybe it's something that any, somebody should obviously support that. But uh, as long as it is uh, not like 45 minutes reduced to 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but the difference is, is that you'd actually be hearing, instead of from one person coming in, trying to represent all the arts, I mean, we could do a theater video of what does it mean to be a theater artist and go into a country, and that's something they can watch whenever. It wouldn't necessarily be part of their, their two-week training because they're so tightly booked, but it would be a resource. It would be a resource that people... Anyhow, that's, so these are ideas moving forward. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to hear from people who'd like to work on either of them, and I'll be in contact with, with various people about that. Here are just some overall reflections as we move the conversation forward very briefly. Um, these are what-ifs. These are not shoulds. These are what-ifs. I, I heard a lot of language over the weekend um, that attempt to monetize the arts um, and attempt to, ca to categorize the arts as something that we use to do something else. I'm interested in exploring how do we think about demonetizing the arts. Stop treating, if we stop treating cultural diplomacy as a product, it's something, you know, as something that we leverage to accomplish something, and this is what somebody else said before about the, the State Department's goal. So how do, at least among ourselves, is it worthwhile to pay attention to the language that we're using and, and really resist this effort to commodify this thing that we're calling cultural diplomacy, and it may mean, as Derek said last night, it may mean using a different term. 
Again, what ifs. I'm just putting. Can I, can I just comment on that real quick? I know you wanted to go through your one. Well, just because there are other people who want to speak and uh, want to take okay, up all the time. Do you, what, I'm I was sure just going to because what, what was interesting to me about that is there's the, mo the, the language of monetization, uh, you know, consumer language, you know, monetizing. But there's also the instrumentalizing language. Right. I think and, I'm, com I'm combining. Okay, but I, we might want to keep them separate because mm -hmm. I think one of the things is it's hard to get away from the, the question of instrumentalizing. And I would just say that one of the interesting dynamics in the discussion over the last several days is, on the one hand, the recognition that the applied arts and applied humanities and applied cultural work has some dimension of that or other. And it's how we think about that, rather than always necessarily thinking of it as, you know, kind of the arts trying to meet, you know, a commercialized, you know, um, requirement upon its work in some way or other. That's an imposition. Together with other interesting developments like how do you facilitate and build capacity for counterparts mm -hmm. and, and promote their goals and aims? And so kind of bringing to, reconciling the language of instrumentalization is not necessarily about you know, commodification with how to promote and, and build capacity of others mm -hmm. is an interesting thing that I think has been kind of a space that has been identified in what people have been talking about. Mm -hmm. I, and I think this is, I'm obviously putting out some provocative thoughts for our, our collective ruminating. So th that's, that's one perspective. I'm actually proposing, yeah. I'm, oh, you, but, but you're coming from, I mean, you know, we're working together, but you're coming from one place and I'm yeah. coming as an artist from another place. And I'm noticing, and so this is, this is my second point, is fighting fire with fire the best solution? Um, in other words, is learning to speak the language of money and monetization and implementation nice. and what you're saying, does that not feed the fire t to more of that? And I'm just, again, I'm just being provocative here and it's not all one way or all the other, but I noticed a pull towards this language of implementation and I noticed a movement away from the language of art, right? Which is very much about keeping it simple, focusing on the human, letting the form, as Anne Bogart likes to call it, the container, reflecting the content, right? When we're talking about implementation... I'm so sorry, Dan, but we're going to have to just compress you a little bit because we've got to let the other people talk. I know people keep asking you questions, including me, but look, why don't we just hear the rest of the, of the what if so other people... Can that's, talk. yeah, that's what I was doing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm simply suggesting that we trust performance as methodology, as Soini was talking about, and, and asking the question, how do we do this? How do we let the performance as methodology have impact? How do we continue to work artfully and to speak clearly and passionately as artists and inspire others with the artful way that all of us, including uh, there's art to administration, there's art to, um, uh, to everything that everyone in this room does, how do we move through the world and connect with others using art and performance as the methodology, not necessarily implementation and monetization? And again, it's just a thought to reflect on. It's not a, a should. Okay, thanks. Interesting. I wanna, there's two things I want to just pull out like super fast of that, that the, um, one is uh, to, we, um, Daniel actually invoked Michael Rode, who's not here, but whose work some of you know, but who is involved with uh, the creation of a kind of center for performance and civic practice. And a lot of that work and a lot of his work has been about trying to work directly with governmental bodies of one kind or another with kind of perfor you know, performance, skills of performance and facilitation. And it feels to me in that that's been a theme and that's here in Washington and here at Georgetown, even though that, that strand hasn't been quite in the room with Michael not able to be here or whatever, but that's another kind of partner in this work, I feel like, going forward. Um, and I want to make sure as we keep moving that this conversation, this is selfish in a way for us, but it's for everyone in the circle, about, about structure that you pulled out there, sort of like the structure of how we gather we're not going to solve that today, but that we don't lose that strand about, you know, the feedback of everybody in the circle about ideas about that. I really want to make sure we get to and whatever we don't get to by noon, get to in sort of smaller ways, because that's how, where we go forward from here is, is uh, and how we go forward uh, is obviously of momentous importance. Yeah, please. Just, just to um, clarify, you know, what we're talking about here, it, it may not be for everyone. You may say, no, no, I, I don't really want to do that. I want to go do my thing and, and have it, you know, stand on its own, in its own artistic, aesthetic, whatever um, merit, which is which is totally fine. But just to come back to the beginning, what, what motivated this was 
Derek and me coming together around the incredible impact of the international performances that he brought here, like Ping Chong, like Belarus Free Theater, like Da Theater, and seeing how the Foreign Service students went to those and were so moved and kind of didn't know what to do with that. Because that didn't fit into their paradigm of what is important and how to understand and work in the world. And, and then similarly, they're going and doing theater with Derek, and they don't know how to fit that in either. So this, this selfishly again, this is our desire to bring those two together and find a way in looking at things like what that Carol is doing at Syracuse, where the mm -hmm. whole freshman entering class, you know, 3,000 students are going to see this Voices from the Congo. That's going to be where they're launching that. The university, that's an incredible, incredible thing. And it is, I freely confess to instrumentalization. I want people in the State Department to understand that if they want to effectively counter extremism in Pakistan, they have to look to what Shahid is doing. And they have to understand that as something political that they can use. I am completely in favor of using. And so that, that just may not be for, you know, people may say, no, no, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I don't like the US government. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And that is totally fine. But we are here looking for ways and languages and methods and structures to bring those two worlds together, recognizing the incredible value of what is actually going on in many countries and also recognizing this new model of cultural diplomacy, which Jonathan and Joanna and others are doing, not bringing things American there. I think we all agree this is an outdated model, useful when it is used as Susan's was, you know, to raise really interesting issues, open up society and do all sorts of incredible things. So it still has a place, but an increasingly valuable model is capacity building, raising, leveraging, uh, empowering local voices so they go out in their own language, in their own way, and convey messages that are sympathetic to messages that we like, and I don't mean we, the US government, I mean we human beings who care about other human beings living decent lives, but they do it in their own language. So increasingly, the role that we from the West have is to facilitate that, leverage that, train that, mentor that. So that's a different model. It, they all involve some form of in, instrumentalization. I, I was just talking about the language we use. I wasn't talking about the process. I agree completely with everything you've just said. I was just asking, do we want to pay attention to the language that we're using to describe that process? And do we want to find more of a balance between what artists do and how we communicate while we're doing it? and the language in those exchanges that are being used. That was yeah, my sure, only sure, question. Sure. Great. Let's go to Sim. Sim. Okay. So th these are um, reflections from our table. They included Taraj, Pam Corza, Juanita, Rob, Rob um, uh, JJ, and Jennifer Nelson, and Simone. Um, I think there's about seven or eight points here. I'll make them succinctly as possible. Um, so we finally decided that our question was, what is needed to strengthen work in this area? And these are the things. Real and virtual spaces where those engaged with arts, culture, cultural diplomacy, peace building, and the arts can find each other, can be found by communities and agencies that would like to engage with them, and newcomers to the field who can find paths of entry. So real and virtual spaces. Um, more clarity about the meaning of particular discourse frames, especially as they inform practice, and spaces where language and concepts, like spaces like this, right, where language and concepts can be negotiated, revised, clarified, and contested. Um, and some of the discourse frames are cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, intercultural diplomacy came up this morning, peace building the arts, art and social transformation, arts and social justice, cultural work, theater, aesthetics, performance, drama, and et cetera, uh, thinking that in other art forms as well. 
And another lens on that um, was perhaps a new discourse frame that is based on the synergies between arts and culture and various approaches to diplom diplomacy, peace building, and social justice. Um, and I would say from this experience, we can see the need for sustained conversations, sustained communities of practice and inquiry. Because when people just come together once, we're just finding each other and yeah. they're exploring our differences, but you can't, you have to go, to go deeper. You have to have some sustained conversations. Um, let me come back to this. Um, so clearer and more effective language to communicate to policymakers and funders about the efficacy of cultural diplomacy and arts-based approaches to peace building. So concise, clear, powerful messages in a strategic co campaign to communicate them. And that's a serious work that you know, needs sustained attention. Um, uh, more and more compelling documentation. So what is the best evidence that we have available from um, program evaluations and also from research? What, are, what do we know about short-term effects? What do we know about how those effects contribute to longer-term changes in institutions, policies, and cultural norms? So we'd say more research initiatives and more evaluation assessment and support for critical self-reflection. Um, we need more support, like we need more money. <laughs> we need, uh, <coughs> so we talked a lot about how to leverage sources of support given the history of um, you know, the defunding of arts initiatives, but we thought about governmental support, major investments from foundations, universities as sources of support, businesses in the, in, in the arts industries, can they be leveraged for support for this kind of work? And individuals, including individual artists and cultural leaders who may have personal resources because of the celebrity universe that we operate in. Um, more and more rigorous ethical reflection on work. So awareness of potential harms, which I won't list out, um, and awareness of the agencies, of the agendas of the agencies and governments who might support our work, um, and how the risk of, of our work being appropriated for larger agendas that we don't actually support. So I think um, I made the point the other day about the need for artists to be aware of how to analyze the agencies of the agendas that we're working with. Um, and I would say um, more people who straddle the various worlds of culture, creative work and peace building and diplomacy. In other words, people who can have a foot in both worlds and negotiate the institutions and translate for each other. And I would just say about this, this question that just came up about instrumentalization. This came up at the, uh, the very beginning of the Acting Together project and we kind of made a tacit agreement to like hold it lightly and to sort of look at the paradox mm -hmm. of it. You know, that in some ways the, way, the reason why the arts are so incredibly powerfully transformative is because they aren't described in terms of their use or their mm -hmm. uh, effects. It's, it's like it, it really does stretch our paradoxical mm -hmm. thinking. Um, I know that a lot of artists would be alienated by the language of use just as much as a lot of policymakers need the language of use. Mm -hmm. So how do we acknowledge all that and try to move within that? Mm -hmm. This was a great, I, had, I was lucky enough because Cindy needed to print it and so I saw this as an outline this morning and for me just, it, it's incredibly, even this idea of the language itself which we're grappling with and the space of negotiation, revision, clarification and contestation, I mean that's a, a paradox too because there's moments where we have to have the conversation about what term do we need, like and we're having that around cultural diplomacy, but then to acknowledge that the fact that that's a problem <laughs> is, 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 you know, is, is for real reasons. It's not because there aren't a lot of smart people trying to come up with the term. There's, some, there's something at play there. So the work of coming to the term, of, of figuring out the term, also needs to stay present as a dialogue uh, rather than just arriving at something which alienates half of us <laughs> and excites the, you know, some of us. So there's just so many things here that, that really helpfully still. Let's keep moving through our, and so we just keep, I think, so I think with our other, uh, um, uh, sort of leaders of these groups who will get all that stuff into the circle and then I think we'll have time to go. So let's go uh, to Nick. Well, um, it's reassuring because a lot of the stuff covered, we, we covered as well. Okay. So I, I don't, I'll go quite fast through it, hopefully as fast as, as Cynthia. 
and I felt slightly diffident about the whole thing because I'm an outsider and uh, not being American. But um, it was sort of interesting that, that we're grappling with somewhat the same problems in, in Europe as, as, as you're grappling with here. Um, we were really quite practical. I had um, Amy from the British Council, um, Susan, Diane, Ragsdale, and eventually, at the end of our discussion, Nick Cull. So we were a very, very small group, and three students who were having difficulty deciding what they would do in the future. Anyway, one of whom was off to Cambodia to find out. <laughs> um, um, the, one of the first points was the difficulty of lobbying for State Department money because there was no culture program, doesn't have, it doesn't have a separate budget, and we should be lobbying for a cultural budget within the State Department. That was one thing that came up straight away. Putting the arts more centrally into US foreign policy, but not prioritizing political values. Finding a new narrative of cross-cultural understanding having a chance of telling US stories in the same way that the Dutch, the French, the Germans, and the British have, with government support to tell their stories. Persuading people that the US narrative reflects back on the huge energy and entrepreneurship of the cultural diversity of local US communities, a point which was made over there about New Mexico and all that sort of thing. Um, Frustration that foundations look at mosquito nets, but not at actual cultural exchange. And because of the lack of funding, there was a huge frustration from our group of, about the lack of socially engaged theater in the United States. Um, also, big frustration that frust the foundations are not easily lobbied on this issue. Multiple conversations have been had, but to no avail. The question was, how can the arts be the next new fad and cultural exchange? Participatory models were all the rage, and it's exactly the same in England. And there was some worry as to whether participation led to amateurism, whether it compromised artistic values by dumbing down. And that was a trap we all felt could be fallen into if we weren't careful. Um, more effort, we felt, should be made to track models and aggregate best practice. We urgently need more translators to describe and illuminate the process between policy and practice. The sort of work that Nick Cull is doing, we need to find more people who can do that to make the politicians and the foundations understand what we're doing. Um, lack of joined up thinking from all of us in the arts and also from foundations, State Department, NEA, Congress, government offices. We should be on a mission to lobby for more joined up thinking and we should do it ourselves. Um, and that this group should be a lobby for cross-cultural understanding and to advocate socially engaged theatre. And we had, we felt very strongly that we should besiege the incoming Secretary of State the minute his or her feet hit the ground. We also, funnily enough, came up with an idea of a 30-minute film, but our film was to be led by some very famous people in the arts to show good practice, to actually be made maybe five examples of extremely good cross-cultural and cultural diplomatic good practice and to put it out there and give it to Congress and the Secretary of State immediately and say this is what can be done and use it for advocacy to try and move ourselves up to the top of the agenda in the same way as the Clinton speech which you opened with talking about how she had actually suddenly realized the centrality of the arts and cultural diplomacy we start at the beginning by saying, this is what the Secretary of State needs to lead on. We can make a difference. I mean, I'm, I was very struck. There was an article some time ago in the Financial Times where a well-known economist um, was looking at the way the, the rhetoric the arts uses and the way 
economics is, is spoken about, that drugs companies that make pills and treat patients contribute towards the economy. That is generally in economic arguments thought, the capitalist argument that pertains. Whereas doctors who treat patients and help patients recover actually cost the economy. And that's how people think in those terms. And that's exactly what happens with the arts. It is thought the arts are a drain on the economy and we have not captured the rhetoric that basically says the arts contribute towards the economy. They contribute spiritually to people's happiness. They contribute to understanding. They contribute to cultural diplomacy. And they have a real monetary value. And we have never made that argument properly. We always are regarded as a drain on the economy. And we have to chip the argument the other way around. That's my personal view rather than the view of what was said around the table. But we all recognised that this whole conversation was about money, finally. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, let's go to Shahid and then get everybody's voice on this. So just to, so we're sure to do that. Well, uh, expectedly, uh, quite a few uh, things have been uh, already covered. So I think in our group, it was about uh, seven or eight, eight people, including uh, our group. Professor Roger and uh, Joanna from and Michael from Bond Street. Professor Martin Can't hear you. Can, can you Joseph. pull your seat up a little more so we can and, see uh, you? And uh, uh, Iraqi uh, artist Yahya. So we uh, we did a lot of talking, but we ate also. I, I <laughs> <laughs> in Daniel's case, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, well, uh, I think uh, generally we all uh, uh, found uh, this uh, convening fascinating and also a rare occasion where uh, academics and uh, policy, uh, people involved in policy making and performers and also from a uh, variety of uh, cultural, social backgrounds from other countries, they were uh, here and people thought that a lot of uh, issues were very uh, debated very well and uh, although we may not have, have found answers to uh, many questions but it was good that the questions were raised and it, that is in itself an achievement. There was an interesting debate on this issue which I'm sure uh, has been debated uh, elsewhere also of the role of state department or diplomats and uh, culture and artists. So there were people who thought that there is an inherent conflict, while well, departments like the State Department, they have a clear, concrete uh, view of uh, what are uh, their objectives. And uh, artists are more uh, visionary and they are looking for truth rather than uh, concrete uh, um, uh, response. And uh, this uh, also, this was said that uh, the artists sometimes have their own point of view or own uh, cultural diplomacy which could not necessarily be, uh, could not necessarily converge with what the uh, diplomats or state department would be uh, uh, aiming for. But it was also <coughs> pointed out that state department is a big department and individuals matter and in Afghanistan's case we were told that well, they are letting uh, them do the uh, project and every time uh, uh, the theatre people from the group meet the concerned officials, they say, so what are you doing in Afghanistan? So sometimes they don't even take interest or register what's going on, but they let uh, good people do their work. So one should not uh, write that off completely. <laughs> and obviously everyone agreed that uh, 45 minutes is not many minutes for, <laughs> for uh, cover, covering the whole of culture. So uh, there is more uh, need for giving more time to sensitize and um, uh, educate the diplomats about the use of culture. And um, then uh, one point made here was that uh, the, 
and the diplomats and if they are cultural diplomats normally they are, uh, the diplomats are not posted for a long time in one place and this is a deliberate policy because they don't want to get too close and uh, become native and then lose their objectivity. So uh, this is also something which needs to be reviewed because uh, now it's my own experience that uh, there was a Norwegian uh, uh, diplomat who later on became ambassador who knew excellent Urdu and had become a Pakistan specialist. So the things he could discuss and places where he could go and people he could relate to uh, was unbelievable. I mean, he had more access to, for example, the fundamentalist or religious lobbies than we ever had. And I don't think that diplomats are so, so weak in their uh, 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 intellectual position or political position that they will be influenced and decide to maybe <laughs> switch loyalties. So that is uh, uh, something not going to happen. So this point was made forcefully that uh, uh, there is a need to uh, review the, um, uh, the um, position which uh, the cultural diplomats have in one country and they should be regarded as a resource rather than uh, as something uh, which they shouldn't be doing. One other interesting point made was that U.S. cinema, this was made by our Iraqi friend, Mr. Yahya, that U.S. cinema gives a very different, Hollywood gives a very different image of uh, America. Mm -hmm. As if uh, every American has a gun or there is crime on every second street and there are aliens roaming about everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, 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 it's true, that it's true. <laughs> He suggested that uh, if a theater with real live humans, if it is sent to other countries, people might uh, have a different impression that yes, there are uh, human beings living in the United States. So uh, <laughs> we're determined to find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <they can. laughs> so. Um, um, one, or one other interesting point made was that when the foreign group is especially from the third world country is brought to US uh, for performance. It is also not only it's enriching for the audience in this country and maybe audience from that particular ethnic background, but also back home he gets kind of a certificate, a kind of authority that he has been recognized in the US. So they uh, becomes more uh, become stronger in their own country. So this is an additional advantage of uh, bringing in uh, uh, artists from uh, such countries. And then uh, also uh, people lamented, and which has uh, been mentioned earlier, that if uh, uh, the US could have uh, institutions like Goethe Institute, Alliance Francaise, and British Council, uh, uh, things would be better and this direct a conflict which sometimes takes place of uh, the State Department versus the political forces of that country so that might be overcome. And I remember in uh, uh, way back in Pakistan there used to be American centers. So mm -hmm. I remember that, uh, well, I mostly remember that they were air-conditioned and that <laughs> <laughs> it was very rare. So young people in summer especially. <laughs> <laughs> and to while uh, to pass their time, they would also read some U.S. magazines mm -hmm. and newspapers and maybe get to know about uh, the American society better. Huh. One concrete um, proposal uh, which has appeared in other uh, forms here also uh, at, uh, at the convening was that a, a global performance center should be set up, preferably uh, in a place like Georgetown and other campus, which should not only specifically uh, interact and reach out to uh, uh, international uh, groups, especially from uh, the third world, but also uh, analyze and uh, uh, w uh, serve as a resource for uh, international uh, drama and international theater groups, because that kind of information is not easily available in the US. And uh, last point, which was also made uh, by um, other groups, is that impact assessment by policy makers, state department or other grant making organizations is 
like uh, uh, theater is also a commodity which can be quantified and which can be uh, statistically um, uh, explained. So there should be different way of uh, measuring the impact of um, of theater or art than they measure the impact of uh, economic aid or technical uh, information or developmental work. So I think uh, that is something which I would personally also endorse because uh, once we uh, we see how um, what kind of uh, information is required from uh, foreign donors, especially in the U.S., it is quite mind-boggling for artists to see how they can quantify the impact, how they could quantify the evaluation of a piece of art, uh, where uh, sometimes the result might uh, appear five years later, how it has influenced uh, a certain community. So this was broadly what was uh, discussed and uh, following uh, Daniel's lead, I will add in some personal uh, comments also, if I may. Uh, firstly, uh, although there has been a talk about the use of new technology and social media and uh, uh, video technology, video conferencing and uh, what was it, the term, tele? Telepresence. Telepresence. Oh, right. Okay. okay. So, uh, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think there is still nothing like uh, uh, having a live human being on stage and experiencing that, that kind of theater because especially the kind of theater which we do or the kind of theater which you saw last night, uh, it's not something which can be, uh, although individual to individual communication can take place, but the experience of theater, still the technology has not found uh, an alternative to live uh, theater's experience. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, um, the, the role of uh, uh, donors or funders is uh, two, uh, two, of two kinds. One is to enable the groups, uh, theatre groups in their own country to carry on uh, their work. Because uh, judging from my experience and experience of our friends in Iraq, the, the governments or the other institutions, they are... Uh, at the best indifferent to uh, performing arts and theatre uh, or, or usually antagonistic and hostile as well. So and now the additional force of uh, extremism is there which is trying to block the, the path of uh, performing arts and theatre. So that is one uh, important part of uh, how uh, the US can help uh, artists in uh, such situation. The other is to uh, enable these artists to become ambassadors of their own countries because the image of uh, Muslim countries like Pakistan here is uh, dependent on either what the governments in those countries decide to uh, project or what the media here uh, uh, decides to project. So usually it is distorted and if uh, uh, the people in, um, of America and uh, also the policy makers see how uh, cultural activities, activists and uh, theatre people, how they are fighting out their battle which needs uh, international support, then I think maybe there could be some significant changes in the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. So we have about, I think, 40 minutes or so to kind of, with everybody in the circle talking, kind of try to, be, you know, to take Continue, take stock of where we go from here. There are two quick things I wanted to lift out of that. For me, it feels like the, the paradigm of translation surfaces in different ways in all of these, and sort of like, uh, I just keep coming back to thinking about, I mean, even what Nick's talking about was sort of translators in the sense of not just the literal language, you know, a one-to-one -one kind of translation, but the idea of a kind of cultural translator of kind of experience, things that are known to be embodied from the, you know, from the artist to one other kind of person and creating more, as what Cindy was talking about, sort of straddlers, you know, people to do that work. Um, so that's just something that feels like in different ways people are talking about that need and how even in terms of trying to claim some language around that and ways that Georgetown and others might 
sort of own an interrogation into what we mean by translation as part of the work that there is to do and try to, because I think the surface, you know, I think about this, you know, a beautiful Walter Benjamin essay, right, the task of the translator, but, you know, which is a beautiful, like, gets you thinking about translation as more than the way we tend to use it. And so I just think that word, that word and that idea is, is very live for me in this. And then it's interesting to be hearing, of course, you know, we're at Georgetown about what might happen here. I would just say wanting anything we do here is going to be, need to be very nimble and agile and not a huge bureaucratic, let's start now and build, uh, build a huge new structure. It's going to want to float and be in dialogue and, and partnership with so many others here. So even in terms of thinking about what, you know, Syracuse and Brandeis and organizations like Theater Without Borders and so many others that are represented in the circle hearing about <laughs> what we might all create together where in the virtual and actual spaces uh, what is not the hope I think can say is to come out of this and make something here and invite people sometimes like to come get a whiff of it like it's 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 that's the sense you know this could be a location where certain things center around but but I just throw that out there because I think the importance of keeping other institutional partnerships in the, in the conversation seems really important. Um, so in the next 35 minutes, there's a lot of strands. <laughs> uh, but I think, I, you know, we'd love to hear uh, from folks. Susan. Um, I just, um, I guess what I am hearing, um, it seems to me there are two different endeavors going on. One is the model of professional artists going into communities and working with ordinary people, not professional artists, but ordinary people, and using what they know about art to help people understand more about themselves, deal with issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you were talking earlier in the a couple of days ago about sustainability, it seemed to me, and I didn't, I don't know if all of you, Jonathan, you if you all address this, but to me, sustainability in that endeavor involves teaching, serious teaching of people in those countries how to do what you do. Because if you don't train people, it will just, it, it, however wonderful that experience is, it's not going to last. It's just going to be among that wonderful small group of people that have had that great experience. But if, if one of the really important aspects of this is training people in the countries to carry on this work, to me that is, I mean, I know it's, it's, it, it would be a whole other endeavor, but to me it's a, it's a crucial uh, next step in what people are doing. The second thing, which is more what Nick and I do, is has doesn't really have much to do with that at all. It's a completely different <coughs> endeavor, and it's it's really about um, what what I would like to think of is, and it has it has to do with excellence. It's not just the message; it's also excellence. I can bring a, pl a, you know, a mediocre play with a message. Uh, to me, that doesn't serve anybody. I think it's about excellence. So that the best theater company or dance company or in the world, in, or in the American world, should be encouraged to come and do these things. That um, it's not just about the message, but in a, there is something about the American experience, American plays, for example, they, they're different than a, a British play. They, sh they show a different part of, there, there is something called the American character. I mean, there are, when you think about the best American plays, they, 
it's not just about the message, it's the way the people, the way the act, the way the characters approach problems. I mean, there's so many things about a great American play, whether it's showing, you know, something very troubling in the society, whatever it is, it is very, very specific. And it's, it, it also addresses this, you know, this notion of being a counterpoint to this sort of, you know, pseudo-fantasy world of a lot of cinema, which gives a very, very distorted view of, of um, you know, of, uh, of us as Americans. And so great plays give a, tr it may be uncomfortable, but it's a true view of who we are. And so I think that, um, I, and, I, and I think that, I think, I think, as I said, I think there's not, I think that what, what if you do that, I mean, per, I'm going to talk personally, I mean, I have a very particular interest. I'm interested in bringing an excellent play that's aimed basically at young people, at the future decision makers. That's, that's my personal interest. Another theater company may have a very different kind of an interest, but I know that that's my interest. I want to, I want to talk to the future decision makers in whatever country it is so they have a clear picture. They can like it or not, but it's a clear picture of what this, of who we are. And hopefully, because, I mean, I believe in the value of certain kinds of American values, that's what I'm putting out there. So I do think that we should distinguish between these two kinds of activities that everybody in this group, we do have different, different things that we bring and that different advantages or disadvantages. And we should, we should sort of think about it that way. Okay. Um, I, I take the natural thing to get together project that actually the entire spectrum can be included. And in the Acting Together project, it is included. There are artists in the Acting Together project who do excellent work with <laughs> artist-based work. They just happen to be living in a war zone. Um, so they are artists in conflict zones. And then there are artists all across the spectrum to people who are working directly to do uh, Palestinian artists and Israeli artists working together on a project. So it, I think that it is possible in the vision of what is the impact of each of our work in a political context to include all of us. As, as practitioners, we can make that division, but we can also agree to be all in the same circle under the rubric of you do effective work culturally as a cultural diplomat for the United States, and so do I. And I do different work in East Africa than what you do, but we're both cultural ambassadors when we go. So it is possible to include us all. I think the biggest decision that is different is who is willing to see themselves as a cultural diplomat and who really feels that they don't want that uh, circle in placed around them. Personally, I'm, I'm into cultural diplomacy because I think that theater uh, because Theater Without Borders is artists who are in dialogue and when we bring Walid and Amir and Shahid last year, we were acting as, um, uh, acting in the capacity of political people. Uh, and um, so whether it's just bringing guests from Pakistan and Iraq who had never been brought to the United States before, that's an act of cultural diplomacy, just because we're reaching out through our website and our action. So I guess I feel like there's just a, a huge spectrum. But I'm willing to put myself in the pool of trying to find that interaction and to discuss all the complexities of what's uncomfortable about it and what's not. I just want to share our revelatory conversation. There were many, many things I learned this, during this session. And I had a breakthrough talking to you. And you came up to me and you said, you were listening to me, and you said, your moment when you said, you know, there are many artists who say, I made it, and I'm speaking through my art, and that's it, I don't want to have to say anymore. You said, that reminds me of my wife, 
and she's a sculptor, and she doesn't want to have to explain her work. And you, uh, I'll just, forgive me, but then please no, no, say no. more yourself. But um, you said that there's, to you, what struck you was that that was a difference between power and truth, and that people in public policy are dealing with issues of power, and artists are dealing with issues of truth. And I kind of looked at you, and I still wasn't there with you, those two words, and you said, well, that's a broad brush. And then you moved towards something that I found completely revelatory. And I feel like this is the beginning of the translation and the language. You said, people in power are interested in stabilizing meaning. Mm -hmm. Because if they can stabilize meaning, mm -hmm. then they can create strategy around it, they can move through it, and they can, they need to stabilize meaning. But artists mm -hmm. are questioning meaning, revealing new meaning, Confusing meaning. Deferring meaning. Deferring meaning. We're destabilizing meaning. That's what we want to do. That's how we get where we need to go. So now you have two people who are talking to each other. One's trying to stabilize meaning and one's trying to trying to destabilize meaning. And I thank you so much because I feel like now I have a way to begin. That's the kind of conversation I would love to keep going on. So it is you listening to me and me listening to you that is suddenly pushing, beginning to have us take steps towards one another. So the notion of <coughs> repeated convening so that we can develop this discourse, uh, develop more compelling documentation, um, and I really I just want to mention a couple things that, that, that were highlighted to me, so many of the things that have already been said. But in our conversation, we were talking about America houses, and having an America house <coughs> plopped down in Baghdad may not be the place where everybody wants to come right now, even if there's good air conditioning. Um, but we were talking about Coke Studios Pakistan, which you mentioned, and we said Coke Studios Ethiopia, Coke Studios... Coca-Cola. Everybody <laughs> loves Coca-Cola. You know, so that there could be together if we keep meeting, we can find that thing that, that artists keep wanting, these repetitive things we keep saying we want, but we're not getting any new uh, tack on it. And what I find so exciting about listening to these beginning conversations is oh, there might be another avenue in because of things I didn't know about. I just wanted to say, that to, to reinforce you, what you said, Shahid, about amplifying artists in their own countries, a power that I hadn't thought about, that, that we have the capacity to amplify artists as public intellectuals. Uh, uh, when Carlos Fuentes just died, it was huge news and I don't want you to go anywhere, but you are a public intellectual. You are, you know, that we can help amplify that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's just one more thing. But I'm, it'll come back to me, I'm sure. Anyway, so I'm finding it very exciting to be to beginning this encounter of, of, uh, of conversation. Even that beautiful frame of that mean of meanings and stabilizing these are meaning. even naming that starts to do work because if people on the other people whose job it is to stabilize meaning understand that frame for what their job is to do and then if they're in a room with someone whose job it is to destabilize meaning then they look at what they each do differently and then also just quickly follow up sorry taking the organizers it puts it's a very interesting framework for the role of artists in repressive countries mm -hmm. Because there, of course, the yeah. authority figures are trying to stabilize everything, and it is precisely the kind of steep destabilization that artists such as you bring about that actually is what the United States generally is looking for in those countries when we, of course, are supporting military dictatorship. But at least the <laughs> ideals are uh, supporting what you're doing. And stabilizing meaning in repressive societies turns stabilization into sclerosis. <laughs> And when there is sclerotic meaning, then there can be repression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you just jump in very quickly because you just connected for me what I was thinking about. And, and there's been the conversation about um, not just who the artist practitioners are, but knowing the audience, right? Knowing who this work is for. And I think one of the things maybe that um, folks in the State Department 
in, in this context of trying to stabilize meaning, are trying to know that audience and know that know the demographics so that they can be able to predict, you know, how to how to be able to work with them. And we as artists come in and, and we say, oh, here's our piece, but you know, have your own reaction. You know, take from it what you will. But we don't ever seek to really um, say this is the reaction that's going to happen when people watch this play, right? We don't. We hate that kind of thing. It's like no, no, no. We don't want to do that, but um, I think possibly in, in working towards finding a common language of utilization that doesn't commodify, but does still put it in a frame that, that can be understood by policymakers who are looking to stabilize meaning or stabilize you know, their understanding of a demographic of people, we can start to think about the effects, the, the predictable effects that our work could have and really, really take the time to get to know our audiences beforehand, before we seek to present. Really learn about the people that we're hoping to present to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to say one thing about translation and one thing about excellence and one thing about something else. Um, uh, one of the interesting ideas about translation that emerged from the Acting Together project came from our colleague Madhula Palihapitiya from Sri Lanka, who talked about how Tamil and Sinhalese artists could have played a role, but they didn't play, of, in, of interpreting the cultural forms of one community to the forms, to the people of the other. So there were Tamil um, productions that were actually meant to reach out in a, in a peaceful way, that were interpreted by the Sinhalese community as very threatening, mm -hmm. and, but that the artists could have played a role for each other. So I just want to say that I think that that's a different, another kind of translation, and another mm -hmm. kind of work that's needed. Um, Something about excellence is that I think it's important to, as Roberta said, to recognize artist-based work, community-based work, and also ritual or forms that emerge from indigenous communities, to mention what Ben was also saying, all of which can have, have excellence. They all can be done excellently, and, they, and you can do community-based work really professionally and excellently, or you can do it very poorly. And so I think it's important to look at these different forms and look for excellence in all of them, but not think, oh, the artist-based works is excellence and the community-based works is amateur. I mean, community-based work may involve artists or non-artists, but there's a way of doing it excellently, and that's what we need to reach for. And I guess that just leads to this third piece, which is, um, I do think we have to take into account that we live in a world that is reeling still from the effects of colonization. and where cultural forms were a part of large colonial regimes. And when we come with a form, it's not a neutral form. Mm -hmm. And that we and that's why I think it's really important to build into to build capacity and interest in among people who are very skillful in the arts for cultural work, meaning supporting communities to um, remember to amplify their own forms. Um, and uh, to build their own, not, not, not to, you know, out of nostalgia or to, but to develop their forms and not always have to be receiving ours, that, that there are meanings in that, in terms of power. Mm -hmm. Just on excellence, the, the, we'll, we'll bring that across those different groups. And I also think we have, there are many examples of groups whose excellence or sense of historically of excellence because of how their position gets them in a position to do a project that itself may not have that excellence, you know, so I think sometimes, you know, our, our great institutions don't always achieve excellence every time in the way that we would want, you know, just by being, because we, by being excellent, so the work itself. If um, I could just add to that excellence yeah. thing. Uh, Go ahead, Joanna. Yeah, uh, you know, the funny thing that happens is if you're working with regular people and have no theater training, and you're, you're doing this kind of good work, helping them along, teaching them how to do theater, eventually when they get good, they start having the same conversations we're having here. <laughs> well, should we go for excellence or should we go for meaning? And how topical should we be? <laughs> <laughs> conversations, of course. You know, we're all reach the same point. Um, this has been fantastic, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning. Um, and I wanted to throw a point in that goes with kind of the summary points you were talking about earlier. And it may have come up, but if it didn't, I think it's important to recognize that this group of people is pretty exceptional in that you're really committed to international work and it's probably one of the few groups where there are a number of people who do it 
full time or it's your core mission. Mm. In the larger arts community, most of the international work happens as a component, an activity, a sidebar. Mm -hmm. And even within the governmental institutions, it's marginal to the endowment's mission. It's a part of the State Department mission, you know, in a certain interpretation. So that's part of the challenge here. And the whereas in every art form, this is sort of more a field. And it's an emerging, it's been emerging for, you know, I don't know, year, decades at least. Uh, and there's no service organization. There's no, not, this, this group probably constitutes the closest thing to a service organization for this field right now. So in the consideration of sustainability and long-term thinking, I think that's an element that needs to be grappled with. Uh, I'm not sure, and I have no solutions, but I think it needs to go on the table with the rest of the, the points you've been talking about, To, um, If you're going to be, and you know, lobbying is maybe too strong a word, advocating, uh, the, it's, in, it's really incredible the way this group as a loosely formed network has been able to make these advances forward. I think the university connections are key, and maybe that's part of how you look to more, um, to to, uh, to identifying what a a service organization and network a more structured network might be, and also a, a look at the other parts of the arts community that are doing this. As we were talking last night, sort of on an opportunistic basis, somebody knows somebody who's coming from another country, so there's a presentation or theater artists meet, and yes, we're going to collaborate. Those kinds of opportunistic which are great, but if you're a nonprofit organization, your board alone will let you get away with that for so long, you know, devoting resources, people, and so on. So I think that's a challenge in the infrastructure that um, would be a point for continued discussion. Can I add to that a little bit from the university connection? I think one of the things that's important as sort of universities as pass-through organizations and for help and funding is that universities are a really interesting and unique position to absorb risk mm -hmm. and so we we can offer things that it's part of our mission to do things that are risky and edgy and try to do new things it's called primary research for the scientists and for the artists it's called new work so mm -hmm. I think um, I, I really <coughs> appreciate that we're talking about the university. I think we should really think about how we can embed not just the conversation, but some of the action right. in some mm -hmm. of these university programs that are, are, are trying to make a name there. Yeah, and, yeah I think that's very well put. It was also, I wanted to say, we're talking a lot about, you were, you were mentioning also training the people abroad. Right. But it's, we need so much training to here. people here. here. And it's at the universities where the future decision makers are. And if we there already can make them believe that the arts are important, that's when we get steps forward. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and not in every single country, of course. But. I also, this is a quick insertion, but I'm curious, and it's a it's sort of a glimmer of a dream kind of now, but, but having been able to take work from <coughs> Georgetown to a world festival of theater schools and meet, you know, get a, I get a lot of emails from people positioned around the world about coming to America to work from international, from makers, from, from people who, for whom the idea of their cultural diplomacy and their theater work are probably, whether they have that language or not, are probably already one and the same thing in terms of how they're thinking about what they do in the world. And so I'm curious about the potential of truly international training in these sites here, what that looks like, what as a lab for bringing together people from different parts of the world with different cultural and aesthetic traditions in one space, so it's not just we're here or we're there, but that some lots of, of us have teaching areas in all over the world. We have one in Beijing, in South America. We have five centers in Europe. I don't think we're using them as effectively as we could be to be incubators in other countries. Mm -hmm. The centers are, are for the whole university or? Yeah, we have a center in Florence, Strasbourg, Madrid, London, Beijing. It, for what? They're teaching centers. They're for study abroad, but we also have research centers in all those areas. But to use them indeed 
globally uh, with the people there because I right. do know that a lot of people are also looking at That's the university spreading out as a new colonization. Right, no, I understand that. Which you want to watch out for. No, I understand that. Well and that's yeah. my point, is that yeah, I think no, we're exactly. not using them as effectively as yeah. reciprocal well, areas yeah. for... Right. Yeah. I think uh, uh, I have experience with this whole thing and uh, things happen by chance. As a matter of fact, in, in uh, American University in Cairo, I met uh, Margot. Margot introduced me to Roberta. Roberta invited me after I graduated from UCLA 23 years then. Uh, and uh, uh, Roberta introduced me to Derek, to Cynthia, to Cynthia, to Penny, to, to Orange. So that happened by chance. Right. And now, uh, when I came last year, I didn't tell the university I'm going to America, so I just took, uh, uh, asked for one month and five. This time, it takes me five months. I wanted to bring 15 students to learn here, yeah. to get here. And it was almost impossible. They, right. they agree with one thing and they change their mind. They bring that, the, it will cost money, I don't bring, I don't send artists, why? I send doctors or engineers, so or they find another excuses that maybe these kids going to go to the United States and stay there and they don't, they don't have problems. So the, uh, I'm talking about where I belong, I, I, I work at the university, it's so, so, so hard, very, very, very hard. And these 15 people, we ended with three. So. It, and we, we're supposed to come with <coughs> two plays, and we ended with one. I think, uh, I fear, uh, at this moment, I achieved something, this first step, and with one thing, communication between each other. And face to face, we worked, and thank you, Robert. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nick. Yeah, I think. Say something so I met him. American University, nicely dressed. He said, may I see your show? And he says, uh, I'm passionately interested in international experimental theater. So I connected, I did my best. I wanted to send him some beautiful bread and puppet books. I asked the American Embassy in Baghdad, oh no, we don't do anything for a, a third person. By chance, I met Roberta just by surfing. I told Roberta about Wally, that he feels cut off, and like within three seconds, Roberta <laughs> answers, I'll get him to the TCG conference. I'll do it. Just like that. I mean, it, I'm only, uh, what am I trying to say? I have so much trouble with the American government always have. You know, I come from a much more radical theater background. Bread and Puppet got itself in behind the Iron Curtain. We revolutionized Polish theater people. We asked if we can, this was 69 as I mentioned, can we go to Czechoslovakia? There's the Czech government. Said, no! If you come here, you'll uh, cause a revolution. We got to Iran in 1970. Within a few seconds, we really found out about the government there, although Mrs. Shah, my call her, was a promoter of the arts. But people such as Mahmoud, who we all know, was one of the young students whose job it was to meet us, shake hands, leave in our hands a tiny piece of paper that was folded up. On the paper were lists of artists, children's book illustrators, who were in prison. We did radical theater there. Before one of the shows, my job was to say we made a mistake by coming here and performing for the richest Iranian people and their best French friends. But according to Mahmoud, we really helped just by, of course, it's much harder now to do revolutionary theater as Americans because you've been killed. But just by, what are you all saying, our belief system in making the art, and in our case it was much more critical of the uh, powers that be. 
but I think everyone here is a professional artist, does their best work. And however we bring it there, it is, I was having a conversation with Tolange this morning, everything we do is political. Every conversation is political on purpose or just by the nature of we're doing it. I mean, I don't know what I said it's meaningful, but... Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to address strategy, the strategy of artists to be able to do their work. A lot of people have said to me, my God, how did you do 56 countries? And frankly, I didn't even notice how I did it because one led to the other. And this is what I want to talk about. There are human beings in embassies around the world. And you are all doing excellent work. So when you do your excellent work in Cambodia, and somebody brought you there because you said, we will help you reach young people, you, you spoke strategically, you gave a message that they could present to the front office and then fund you. You got there, and then you do your art. It's not about how you said you were going to do it. You do it, they see it, and they are moved. So then they help you go to Laos and the Philippines and South Korea and China. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like what, what you said. It's by accident, but it's also by connections with human beings that you find mm -hmm. in these bureaucracies. And that's something that I think um, you know, is kind of self-evident to me. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to argue about the meaning of your work or anything else, because that's intrinsic to who you are and what you've been doing. I, um, on strategy, Penny, I'm just wondering whether, as the next step, there could be a presentation to Rocco Landisman um, at the NEA to say, um, we want to see the NEA help us forward the American international agenda both ways. Is that possible? Would he respond to that? I mean, maybe there isn't enough money, you know, even, of course we know there isn't nearly enough money to, to fund the domestic agenda. I understand that. But he's now a bully pulpit. He now can speak, and he now can maybe help us mobilize the kind of resources that we need. And to Nick's point about um, the economic engine of the arts, I mean, the case has been made over and over again. The documentation is here. It's just that people don't read it, they don't listen to it, and they don't act on it. So. We need the big figures. We need people up high. Um, and I love the idea of getting right to the new secretary and all of that. This is, this is great strategy. But what about the NEA as a vehicle um, that hasn't yet? I mean, you, we all know how passionate you are about interna international work, but you haven't been given the resources or the department or the mandate. Yeah. Well, I think it's a question of, of exactly that, the resources and the priorities. And focus of the endowment and the initiatives of this administration are focused on the connection between arts and economic development and the endowment's um, <coughs> logo, what's on our business card now is Art Works and that has the three triple entendre, one of those of which is to inspire, to transcend and so on, which is where international would fit in. I, I think that Rocco would be very open to you know, to a conversation, to listening, but I just, within the resources of the endowment, especially, I mean, our budget is put together two years out already at this point. Um, I, I just don't see that in the picture because of the impact and the struggle that we continue to have. I mean, we're thrilled this year that President Obama has requested $5 million more for the, I guess it's $8, $8 million more five of which is designated for uh, the initiative Our Town, and three because we have to move out of the building that we're in. So the budget framework that we operate in is very tight. The ongoing discussions with Congress are still about you know, the importance of the arts to the economy of the United States. So I'm not sure how much he would want to expand that within, you know, what he's It doesn't have out. to be from the NEA budget. I was at this Fulbright event for uh, last week. MTV was being celebrated by Ambassador Rice and Ann Stock and so forth. It was this huge thing. What were they doing? Sponsoring four Fulbright uh, MTVU. 
I, I never saw so much hoopla about so little. But I, and so I wrote to some people in the State Department, I said, what is this about? And they said, well, there's probably a lot of money that MTV is giving. It's not going into these fellowships, but whatever. So the thing is that I'm just looking for the voices that can get to MTV or Coke or whoever it is and say, this is really important for um, the corporate, the health of the corporate business overseas is the impression that the United States makes overseas. I mean, that, that argument, that very pragmatic argument that might you know, awaken people. And again, we are probably not the people who can get the attention. So that's... I, you know, I will, I think that we would be open to that. Um, there is this organization that I mentioned to you and a couple of other people that's just started that I can't remember the name of, but it's called SAGE Strategic, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but somebody can Google it right now. Uh, it is um, a, a private, uh, private sector effort headed by very powerful uh, people, uh, Goli Amiri, who was the previous Undersecretary for Public Policy and Public Affairs, um, uh, Tara Sun. Tara Feathertide is the correct. Yeah, and, and yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Jay Harmon. Yeah. Anyway, there's some very powerful people behind it, and their intention is to raise, I believe it's $10 million in their first year that have a business plan. I can <clears throat> send the, the there's, you know, a link to it. Uh, and uh, it's related to strategic communications and culture is within the framework, but it's not clear really what their intention is in terms of culture. It is supposed to be a grant-making organization, um, but the, I believe it was maybe two months ago that the announcement of the, of the organization was um, was, uh, I think I sent it to the group that's on my little international list, maybe Roberta got it, but it's still sort of open to understanding what they're really trying to do and if they are going to be successful raising $10 million. But it's exactly that idea to get corporations, especially some of the technology corporations, to contribute to, uh, 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 it's, and it's in the framework of a good image of the United States is good for business. So it's exactly what you're trying to think about, what yeah. you're thinking about. Can I say one thing well, about that? Because that is the opposite, actually, that happened last year, which can see that indeed uh, culture can be for a good uh, investment agency, so to speak. Uh, last year, of course, when everything went down the drain in the Netherlands with the culture, um, Dutch artists put an article in the New York Times, or actually an advertisement, very big on a page that said, uh, don't come to the Netherlands, cultural meltdown in progress. And we had a huge, we had a huge fight actually with our Netherlands uh, foreign investment agency, because in that week that that was posted in the New York Times, four American companies decided not to come to the Netherlands and went to the UK. So you see the actual power. Wow. Mm -hmm. The power of so, paper, tomato. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The formal part of our conversation is about ending. I want to get Nick and, and Stephen and Roberta will be our last three. And then, of course, we will, you know, um, there's no way to tie any of this up in neat bows. There's just so much in this circle. But, of course, we'll continue the conversation. Next I, I just wanted to say one thing that I, th I think you, you underestimate in this country, the one strength, you enormous strength you have above Europe and above the United Kingdom and everyone is the, you have this unbelievable relationship between the professional theatre and universities. In Europe, the universities are distrusted by the profession and there is a you bad do, relationship. Do, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's... Well, but, but, well I, what I'm getting from today, when you, from Georgetown, from CUNY, which sadly aren't here, from Syracuse, and from, you know, I'm certain I've left, I have not, not the great knowledge I should have about this, but there is a feeling of, of profession and the universities communicating, and there are a lot of people who understand about art working within the universities and really do understand. And that should be very much part of the strategy. I mean, the idea, you know, the British Council talk 
and they're, they're terrifically good, and they talk about cultural diplomacy. But if you actually went and talked to any university in England about cultural diplomacy, everyone would look at you completely blankly. They wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. And this is something you do understand, particularly in this city. Um, you really understand, and this is something that's going to help you make the case. And you can lead on this, and you can be terrific as translators um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of translating for strategy and for, for advocating. And I think what this conference has done, I thank you very much for inviting me. I find it tremendously eye-opening. But it's something that you Americans really possess and should be very proud of. It's something terrific. On, on the language and micro-organizational getting of resources, uh, you know, on the NEA question, uh, Theodore J has been especially successful in finding language to talk about how our inter in international work mobilizes uh, local communities. And that's where we've had our most success in getting funding. On the big picture, Washington speak, I can think of another entry point that's based about this um, language of um, power, um, wanting to destabilize meaning <coughs> and, uh, and to stabilize meaning and, and de de destabilizing at the artistic level. At another level, there is the security and development mm -hmm. discussion, which is really mm -hmm. relevant mm -hmm. on the ground. Yeah. And it is there is a kind of stabilization, but when I say development, <coughs> the kind I'm talking about is with some external assistance, but community-led iterative, which has its own arts kind of basis, development. And that, that, that kind of iterative uh, destabilization leading to some sort of more rootedness uh, is something that the stabilizers can understand and look at. And I don't know how you get resources out of that. I've, I've had a few successes, more failure to scale up problems in my life than anyone. Right. Oh, I just want to say that I've learned uh, a number of languages and, 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 um, and I am continuing to learn them. From Sharon, this this conference, I learned that the British Council is publishing a whole new study called Trust Pays. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful, interesting mm -hmm. connection of two concepts. She mm -hmm. said, if people trust the UK, if they trust us, they will invest and there will be mutual investment. Mm -hmm. So trust, which mm -hmm. is our value, which we is a value we can sign on to pays, which is a value that, that, mm. that the partner wants to sign on to. Mm. Um, capacity building, human capacity building. I've started talking with development people. What is your word? What are you looking to do? The open society in East Africa, human capacity building. Uh, Ford Foundation now is all about human capacity building. They'll fund, they'll fund uh, um, uh, spaces, art spaces, uh, but not art. But the goal is human capacity building. The goal is uh, amplifying public voices. The goal is creating events that support public discourse about important issues. Those are all things we know art does, but we've never quite said it that way because we don't know their words. So, so that's why I just want to, to me, it's so important to continue to have conversations with people who are experts in that, those of, in our partners, in the collaborative partners field. So they can teach us, and like you, sir, hear us, and hear what we're saying that you can make connections on our behalf. So this notion of finding uh, ways to continue to, to meet each other, to, uh, Aimee Fullman was so helpful in a long conversation with her over this session, just talking about all that she's learned about these things and wanting to debrief and share with us some of the language that she's learned. And the other thing I just wanted to say is that, thank you very much, Margo, for mentioning that story and Waleed for mentioning that story. What it demonstrates to me is that there are informal methods of cultural diplomacy and there are formal methods. And some of us are more comfortable in the informal. You did not want to be mm. high profile, and it would have been no good at all for Richard Schechner to attend a certain festival in Iran that he was invited to two years ago, mm. because he would have been considered complicit with the regime. He's too high level an artist. Mm. It would not have been good. Mm. It would not have been good to have a U.S. State Department sitting next to you. That would not have been helpful when mm. you, Bread and Puppet, traveled in those days. 
And we are in those days now. I mean, the, 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 the issues of, that the ITI was established to deal with of the, uh, of the former Soviet Union and the West in struggle with, we are in a version of those days, but it's in a different center, it's in different places in the world. And having the U.S. State Department on our shoulder, and I'm a Fulbright, I am a Fulbright, you know, uh, uh, it's not always the best way to go in. So can we also be sensitive in analyzing the, this, this burgeoning field, as you say, Penny, that there are informal methodologies, there are anonymous methodologies, and there are also formal methodologies. And even, even our partners in government could, can the partners in government allow us to have our informal methodologies? Or the intermediary that is the Goethe Institute or the French Cultural Institute that gives them, those people, those cultural faces within countries, protection. Because they're not known as, as you know, the CIA, which is what I'm always asked, am I a CIA? <laughs> No. So this, this kind of discussion, somehow trying to get a grip on this, so I, I hear what you're saying, Jonathan, about wanting to get it right there to, to the NEA or get it to the policy people, but I feel like I'm not quite ready to get it there because I don't know what I'm saying. I don't feel that I know enough about what the other mm. team you know, thinks and sees for me to be able to present it in a, an effective mm. way. So I really appreciate these two days and, no. and look for the time. I just want to say a couple of things in closing, and certainly Cynthia joined me. One is just that we, thanks to Vijay and New Play TV and that world, as far as I know, every word that's been said in this space in the last couple of days has actually been recorded and documented and will be even available at the New Play TV site to look at. But also, so part of our job is both that's a tr an incredible transcript, especially in the kind of like plethora of strands and streams that are here, but it's also uh, the beginning of, of some work in terms of, of also extracting and distilling, and you know, I think I often feel at these things like, oh my god, like where does that all go? And so I think very, very seriously as we think about next steps for this whole, this whole group and this whole enterprise, that's this just incredible resource for us to take really seriously that, that's, that this happened and it's it's not just ephemeral, it has, it has that concreteness. I, you know, I'm biased but, uh, in having uh, partnered on pulling this together, but for me personally, this has been a couple of the most energizing, rewarding days of my professional, intellectual, artistic, creative life, because so many strands and questions, lifelong ones, new ones, uh, coming out of being at Georgetown, came into this, and this has put so many faces to names, to ideas, to visions, to practices, in terms of people whose work uh, students here are studying, that, uh, that I admire. Um, so I just you know, want to just say an enormous thank you to everybody for the time, the energy, the initiative, the thought, the trust that you put into even kind of coming to this space, not knowing what would be here, um, and you know, I think from our point of view, it's just the it's just the beginning of a lot of things, and uh, and um, uh, we'll move forward together in figuring out what those are. Do you wanna, um, yeah, I'll begin first with I think I think I I, I might regret this, but I think we have to. Uh, say that we will pull together out of the Blue Play TV, and thank you so much, we did. We will pull together out of that first the transcript, and then we will pull together some kind of summary report. And we have to have that that we can distribute to you, and that you can distribute, and what we can put up on the website. So we will um, definitely do that. We'll cer certainly all of you before we post it anywhere for your comments and, and um, input. Uh, and that will be the beginning of where we go forward. And, and I hope that we may, there will be more meetings, small and big, to, to keep this going and, and for you to keep talking to, to us and among each other. You know, I've talked a lot about the kind of hard things of uh, reaching the policy world and instrument, instrumentalization and all that, but ultimately I only do this because I'm so moved by the work. And, and, you know, I go to so many 
meetings, they sit there in the working groups, people in places like that, and they debate something like the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, which is so catastrophic right now, so completely talking past each other. And I just sit there thinking, if you could just only see Shahid's play, and if you could see that play and laugh at each other, and then you would take a deep breath and start all over again in a completely different way. And that's why I do it. Thank you all very, very much to be continued. Thank you.